They say that politics and sport don't mix. But at the Winter Olympics in Lake Placid, the mixture proved emotionally explosive and satisfying when the underdog American team upset the highly favored Russians and went on to win the gold medal with the wild appreciation of millions of Americans. Tennis has been called a gentleman's version of prize fighting, but it looked like those two heavyweights were going at each other with gloves instead of rackets. For 10 sets and eight hours. For athletes who did use gloves, it was an extraordinary year as well, especially for Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran. They hammered at each other for 15 rounds in a contest that became a major event, like the World Series or a Super Bowl. Baseball, however, did find a way to top itself over and over and over. After a long season of individual heroics led by the remarkable and redoubtable George Brett, the playoffs and World Series produced an ongoing series of crescendos. With even more athletes taking speaking parts in 1980, sports became an even closer partner to show business. And it is symbolic, I think, that a former sportscaster who first became a national figure by immortalizing the Gipper of Notre Dame is now our president. Home Box Office presents HBO Sports Magazine, 1980 in Review, with your hosts Barry Tompkins and Larry Merchant. Hello, everybody, and welcome to HBO Sports Magazine. Sports Magazine is a new title here on HBO, and along with it comes a new concept. Our aim is to present a look at sports beyond the playing fields and beyond the scoreboards. But today, on this special edition, we're going to take you on a thematic tour of 1980 in sports. We'll stop at all the highlights and the lowlights. Then next month, on our first regular edition, we'll present three feature stories, bringing in-depth television journalism to the world of sports. 1980 in sports is a big and a varied package. And Larry, in the next hour, it's our job to put it all in focus. And focus is the operative word, because so much of sport today is show business, and vice versa. Just think of all the movies with sports backgrounds in recent years, and all the commercials with athletes. Do I have to think <laughs> of the commercials? I guess I do, because the first year of this decade brought sports and show business closer together than ever. For the 20 young men who made up the U.S. hockey team, it was seen originally only as an opportunity to showcase their talents for the professionals. The Russians were acknowledged as the world's best. They had beaten National Hockey League All-Stars, been applauded by hockey purists for their teamwork and discipline, and in an exhibition just a few weeks before the Olympics, they soundly thrashed the Americans. Herb Brooks, the young coach from the University of Minnesota, was also auditioning for the pros. As it turned out, he was destined to join many of the Olympians in the National Hockey League. But at the time, he was pushing his athletes almost beyond endurance in conditioning and training. He paid off. The ambition of the players, the coaching of Brooks, the home ice edge, magnified perhaps by American frustration over the capture of hostages in Iran, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, resulted in a stunning upset. The Soviet hockey team was every part the efficient machine. Since the last time these Winter Games were held here in the United States, an unheralded American contingent stunned the favored Russians. It had been lean, to say the least, for United States hockey glories. But from early in the Olympic tournament, it became clearly evident that this was to be the Cinderella story of these Olympic Games. The Russians were the best on any level, amateur or professional. But somebody forgot to tell the Americans. When all was said and done that night at Lake Placid, there was a new spirit in this country that knew the rally round. Not all the American skaters were as good as gold. Linda Fratiani failed to win the figure skating competition, and an injury to Randy Gardner deprived him and Ty Babylonia of the chance to win the pairs. But a powerful youngster with thighs that would make Earl Campbell proud, Eric Hyden skated circles around the best speed skaters in the world. He won an unprecedented five gold medals in individual competition, winning the 500, the 1,000, the 1,500, the 5,000, and the 10,000. While it may have looked like a daily relay race to the uninitiated, it was a remarkable feat. The equivalent of one athlete combining the Alberto Juan and Lassie Barron track and field gold medal doubles with John Walker's throw in just for good measure. Eric Hyden set a gold standard that can only be tied, and that isn't very likely. 
Meanwhile, the athletes who can get down from the top of a mountain faster than anyone else were playing fall of the leader. The leader in this case was Sweden's Ingmar Stenmark, who confirmed his stature as the world's best slalom skier, winning his first two Olympic gold medals. Meanwhile, the entire country was cheering the hockey team. Thanks, we needed that in celebration of the victory over the Russians and in anticipation of beating a good Finnish team to take the gold. We were disappointed, and though true to their style, they made it suspenseful. Despite the emotional win over the Russians, there still remained that one step between the Americans and Olympic gold. The steady and competitive team from Finland was as much a surprise finalist as were the Americans. There were still questions, still disbelief. And early on, the emotional drain of that victory over the Soviets was evident. But when the ultimate winning goal was put home, time was the only thing that separated the most unlikely group of champions from the highest rung of Olympic glory. It will go down as one of sport's greatest triumphs, a group of individuals who couldn't win and shouldn't win, but did. And all of us shared the sight of Jim Craig looking for his dad. President Carter honored the Winter Olympians, but there would be no American heroes in the Summer Olympics in Moscow. He tried to explain his policy to the Summer Olympians, but for most of them it was a very bitter disappointment. Among the great ones denied the stage of the Olympics were Kurt Thomas, the marvelous gymnast. Nancy Lieberman, probably the best woman basketball player anywhere. Ronaldo Nehemiah, arguably the greatest all-around track man in the world. Evelyn Ashford, who has beaten the champion Eastern Europeans in recent meets as a sprinter. Edwin Moses, the unbeatable gold medalist from 1976. Mary Decker, the record-setting distance runner and Tracy Calkins, destined for a treasure trove of gold. More than 50 nations joined the boycott, but the games were held. And despite their limitations, they were not without Olympian heights and depth. The two great British middle distance runners, Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovette, framed the track and field competition with their magnificent duels. The likable co had smashed every world record from 800 meters to a mile. The first man to do so. But the tough, aloof Ovette had won 45 straight races at 1,500 meters and a mile, and he had reclaimed the mile record in 348 and 8. Co was favored in the 800, but he ran a poor tactical race, and Ovette, right here, upset him. In other Olympic venues, Cuban heavyweight Teofilo Stevenson won an unprecedented third straight gold medal. In gymnastics, the 1976 Romanian nymphette Nadia Kamenich was just slightly flawed, but that was judged fatal by Russian judges who were judged equally flawed in favor of their gymnasts. Two world records were set in jumping events. East German Gerd Vesic cleared seven foot eight and three quarters in the high jump. And Poland's Vladivor Kosakiewicz made it a true pole vault. Spurred on by the jeers of the hometown Russians, he soared 18, 11 and a half. And finally the 1500 meters. But now there was a third factor in the race, Jorgen Straub of East Germany. In the third lap, Straub set a blistering pace that neutralized Ovet's finishing kick. Cole sailed past Straub in the stretch, and Ovet staggered in a beaten third. Cole had now upset him. There were no American heroes in the Summer Olympics, no new Bruce Jenners. The commercials went to the winner heroes. Take it from two guys who've had a lot to smile about lately. Ah, there were some magic moments, weren't they? 
We're going to have more athletes in commercials for you here on non-commercial television just a little bit later. But on a more serious note, Larry, I can't help but wonder if our boycott of the Moscow Games is not going to have some kind of an effect on the Games in L.A. in 1984. That's a tough one to call politically. If the Russians invade Poland, we might not be very hospitable hosts. But you can be sure there will be an Olympics. Worldwide, we expect to take in about $300 million for television rights alone, about three times as much as Moscow would have generated if we didn't pull the plug. Well, we didn't have an Olympic Games, but we did have some summer games that were pure gold, like the ones played by Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. For sheer sustained artistry and intensity, the final at Wimbledon was unmatched in 1980. It left everyone limp, except, of course, Bjorn Borg, who at the age of 24, won his fifth straight Wimbledon championship. If it were a heavyweight championship, they'd have stopped the fight. That perhaps best describes the hysteria that focused on the fourth set tiebreaker at Wimbledon. Six all. Surviving seven match points, McEnroe managed to save the 17 in the tiebreaker. After I won that tiebreaker, first of all, I was a little bit tired, but I figured that uh, I had a pretty damn good chance of winning them because I thought, I mean, you figure after he's won Wimbledon four times in a row and he's in the finals and he's just lost like this long time, you figured he might let up a little. And I said, Jesus, I, if I'm ever going to beat him at Wimbledon, this is going to be the time. The things was going around in my mind was unbelievable. I was thinking, Jesus, in a Wimbledon final you have like six, seven match points and maybe you're going to end up uh, losing the whole match. But in the fifth set, Borg's serve was nearly impossible to deal with. And at six games to five, McEnroe made his last attempts. Borg had willed his way to victory, a victory that elevated him to a position no one before him had attained, five straight Wimbledon titles. Even the tempestuous McEnroe had to marvel at Borg's performance at Wimbledon, but McEnroe tried him again at the U.S. Open two months later, using his own reservoir of strength against the passive Borg this time. Again, it was long, hot, grueling, and tied two sets apiece.
And I said, oh my God, this thing is happening again. But I said, you know, I've gone through all this. You know, I've won this tournament last year. He beat me in Wimbledon. It's got to be my chance to do something. And I just figured if I hang in there long enough. In the fifth set, Macro's moment finally came after four and a half hours. Just being able to do that time after time. If you want to compare it to something else, Ali Frazier, they had three good fights. And that took out so much out of their system. A lot of people said that they never came back from that. Boy, watching that, I can remember wishing they'd play for two solid weeks without a let-up. But I'm sure we can look forward to about three or four of those heavyweight matches each year during much of the 80s. Well, in fact, we almost had a third one last year in South Africa. It was a match that was proposed that each player get, I think, three quarters of a million dollars. But critics of that country's apartheid policies put an end to that. That's just chicken feet anyway, Barry. For two matches, Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran, they split up some $30 million. Now that's serious Kenny Rogers type money. The first fight in Montreal in June was the nearest thing we've had to the first Muhammad Ali Joe Fraser extravaganza. WBC Wellaweight champion Leonard, the flashy, gutsy, charming, unbeaten American hero versus Duran, the complete passionate warrior from the streets of Panama, regarded as the best fighter of the 70s. To everyone's surprise, Leonard stood toe to toe, in part to prove he wasn't just another pretty face, in part because it wasn't easy to escape Duran. Duran gained a decision, but he knew at the end that he was in there with a younger, equally determined fighter who was still coming on at the end. I still was strong. I was far stronger than Duran going to the late rounds. Duran, I think being the kind of guy or caliber of man that he is, it's very, far him, very hard for him to admit when a guy is tough. Um, the question was asked, was I the toughest fight Duran has ever faced or he's been in? And he, has, he was very hesitant about it. Then he said, yes. The first fight was such a financial bonanza that just five months later, at it again. Leonard felt that with adjustments he could beat Duran. Duran, who had been able to beat lesser men when he wasn't in top shape, was not as ready physically or mentally for Leonard. In the sixth round, Duran was completely upset. He was disturbed. So the seventh round, I did what he did to me, just to insult me. I stuck my chin out, motion for him to hit me. He couldn't hit me, and I hit him. I did a, a wind-up bolo type punch, hit him with the left jab. And then late in the eighth round, Shockingly, inexplicably, the great Duran quit. I don't think Ray will ever fight Duran again, and I think it's wise that he doesn't, because I think it's bad for boxing if he does, because there would then be a stigma about the second fight. Ray won that fight so convincingly. He so mystified Duran that it would take away from that victory if there was a third fight. Sugar Ray Leonard's next big opponent could be Tommy Hearn, the tall string bean who hits like a squat. He's the WBA champion after taking care of a good fighter, Pepino Cuevas, right here. Hearns is unbeaten and he's knocked out almost every opponent they put into the ring with him. And then there was Muhammad Ali, the best fighter of the 60s. It took a giant ego to do the things Ali did, and for $8 million, he was willing to subject himself and that ego to a public beating from his former sparring mate, Larry Holmes. Ali offered little resistance. He was humiliated. For his fans, it was a sad ending, even a tragic ending. But Ali, as a keen student of boxing history, remembers that great fighters like Jack Dempsey and Sugar Ray Robinson and Joe Lewis were defeated at the end of their careers, yet they endured as heroes. That any promoter who promotes another Ali fight should be put in jail. I think Ali is well past the age where he can give a competitive performance. He was the greatest fighter of all times. Time has come for him to hang up the gloves for all time.
It was still a pretty good year for heavyweights. Holmes stayed unbeaten, and Mike Weaver ruined the showdown between Holmes and unbeaten John Tate by knocking him out in the 15th round to win the WBA title. And then Weaver looked every bit the champion as he took care of Jerry Coetzee. In a rational world, the two champions would meet and decide which of them was best, as they did before Weaver was champ. Weaver's a sitting duck on those ropes. That's all. That's all. But there's another factor in the heavyweight division. This man, Jerry Cooney, and he changes the normal equation. After destroying his first name opponent, Jimmy Young, in four rounds, the unbeaten Cooney made October a bad month for another 38-year-old heavyweight, Ron Lyle, here on HBO, who demolished Lyle in just one round. Lyle is hurt. And Cooney continues to land on that. Be it. If Cooney gets by another heavyweight from the 70s, Ken Norton, the master plan is for him to meet Weaver for his title, if he wins it, then Holmes for his title, or who knows, Muhammad Ali. So we had a fiasco with Ali, we had a fiasco with Duran. I don't know, Larry, was P.T. Barnum right? Is there really a sucker born every minute? Well, if you're touted on a movie that turns out to be a stinker, do you go back? If you like movies, you do. And if Leonard Hearns comes off, I guarantee you it will be a bonanza. But enough of boxing. How about a sport that doesn't emphasize money and showbiz, like baseball? All right, and I promise I will not mention Dave Winfield's name, not once. Because when all is said and done, despite the worst fears of the fearful, baseball had a fantastic season on the field. There were three terrific division races that went right down to the final weekend and beyond. But 1980 will be remembered first because it turned us into a country of George Brett watchers. What we were watching for much of the season was the emergence of an outstanding ball player into a national treasure. Of all the people in this country who have at one time held a bat in their hands and tried to hit a ball with it, it was clear that Brett could do it better than anyone. The nation turned its eye to Kansas City for months as he hit in 30 games in a row and challenged 400 for two months. He wound up at 390 and averaged a run batted in per game, establishing himself as the best pure hitter for power and average since Ted Williams, Stan Musial, and Hank Aaron. When they weren't pitching to George Brett, there were some pitchers having great years, too. Steve Stone of the Orioles became the biggest bargain of the free agent market, but he won 25 games and the American League Cy Young Award. Stone achieved that after curing a serious shoulder injury with conditioning rather than with the operation and the prayer. Steve Carlton won 24 games in his third Cy Young Award for the Phillies, and he continued to treat the media a disease. In Houston, J.R. Richard, the other dominant pitcher in the National League, suffered a real affliction, a major stroke that temporarily paralyzed him and required extensive surgery. As tragic as that was, because weakness and fatigue were so alien to him, Richards behaved in a curious, frightened, closed-mouthed way for weeks before the actual stroke. His behavior confused both teammates and the media, and in the heat of a pennant race, unkind, unjustified accusations of malingering were made. They left a smoldering bitterness. I think long after that, the scars in his heart from this despicable attack by certain writers who wrote certain articles will live with him forever. Two months later, as the Astros fought against odds to stay in the race, Richards made a dramatic appearance at the Astrodome, career still remains in doubt. Deep in pitching, the Astros hung on, winning a one-game playoff with the Dodgers in the 163rd game of the season. That weekend was a study in climaxes. On the final Saturday of the regular season, Steve Garvey kept the Dodgers alive with this home run in Los Angeles. And doesn't he always seem to get the big hit at the right time? Meanwhile, in New York, Reggie Jackson, who was having one of his best seasons with 40 home runs, hit another one that clinched the division for the Yankees. And in Montreal, Mike Schmidt hit his fourth home run in four days. It was 93rd in two seasons to win for the Phillies. Big players coming through with big hits. Big game. Which was spotlighted in a classic duel at the side of the American League playoffs. Part two of the George Brett Show, you might call it. 
After preserving the victory in the second game with a strong relay throw, thus disturbing Yankee owner George Steinbrenner so much that he eventually fired manager Dick Hauser, who had won only 103 games, Brett came to the plate with a game on the bases in the third game. Confronting him, Goose Gossett, maybe the hardest throwing pitcher in captivity. The irresistible swing met the unhittable object and sent it far into the night. He also sent the Royals into their first World Series. Over in the National League, the Phillies and the Astros had a wonderfully cockeyed playoff series. A series that had the whole country going nuts. Four of the games went into extra innings. Tug McGraw, the irrepressible former You Gotta Believe New York Met, once again emerged as a central character for the Phillies. McGraw, always the team's emotional leader, would appear in nine of the 11 postseason games. He often booed Greg Lazinski who won the first game in Philadelphia with this home run. And Tug McGraw relieved. The Astros took the second game in 10 innings, the first of four straight extra inning games, as the Phillies somehow managed to strand about 50 runners. In Houston, the Astros suffered a blow to rival the loss of J.R. Richard, and Cesar Cedeno broke his ankle running out a ground ball in the sixth inning. But Houston did finally win the third game. They won it one to nothing in the 11th inning. And who was the hero? None other than the veteran Joe Morgan. Morgan got a triple right here that turned out to be something of a last hurrah for him. The great second baseman who had so many fine years with Cincinnati before rejoining Houston was released right after the series. The fourth game was filled with even more craziness. Would you believe a 20-minute rhubarb over a triple play that was really a double play? Had the pitcher Vern Rule catch or trap the baseball? Because of conflicting signals given by umpires, the triple play finally was reduced to a double play. Then, in the bottom of the inning, left fielder Lonnie Smith, the Phillies, after misjudging a fly ball on the previous play, launched this uh, throw. And finally, in the 10th inning, Greg Lazinski drove in the winning run. That run being Pete Rose, who was warming up for the season. Doesn't this remind you of another time, another place? The All-Star game of a few years back? Crash! And the winning run was scored. And once again, on came Tug McGraw to preserve the win to give himself yet another save. The fifth and deciding game was still more improbable. Trailing 5-2 to, to Nolan Ryan, the Phillies scored five runs in the eighth inning. The Astros came right back to tie the game in the last half of the eighth. In the tenth inning, Dell Unser's pinch double and Gary Maddox's single resulted in the winning run. As the Phillies won their first pennant in 30 years. But we hadn't seen nothing, folks. There was still a World Series to be played. Willie Aiken celebrated his 26th birthday in the first game of the World Series. Two home runs. Billy served notice that they came not to play, but to win. And Larry Bowen stole second with the Royals leading 4 to nothing. Bank McBride had a three-run homer, and the Phillies went on to win their first World Series game in 65 years. With Steve Carlton pitching, they made it two in a row the next night in a game that will go down in history with a new king of HR. Uh, not home runs, hemorrhoids. George Brett's hemorrhoids. Poor George, the pain permitted him to get only two hits and two swings before leaving. By the third game in Kansas City, Brett said it was all behind him now. To prove it, he had a home run his very first at bat. Mike Schmidt also homered, but Frank White robbed him of the bid for a game-winning hit in the 10th inning. And then, Willie Akins drove in the winning run against Tug McGraw. In the fourth game, Akins hit two more huge home runs, putting him in a rare league with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig for two two-homer games in a World Series. But once again, it was Brett, who's now famous backside, that stole the show. Dickie Knowles said Brett sprawling on his ailment. And that brought KC manager Jim I a running and a yelling. Stop it right now! Stop it right now! Go ahead and stop it! Stop it out there! Go ahead and tell him! We ain't gonna have that! I'll stop it! No, we ain't gonna stop it right I now! We ain't gonna stop it! You just go get him! You better go get him! Although Brett got 
only three singles in the next two games, nobody really thought the knockdown had intimidated him. But it did carry a message of the Phillies' serious intentions on winning their first World Series in 98 years. And in the fifth game, that message became public. It was a classic. Mike Schmidt's homer gave the Phillies their only two runs, and they trailed going to the ninth inning, three to two. Then Schmidt, who wound up as the series MVP to go with his National League MVP award, singled. Ageless Del Unser followed with a pinch hit that scored Schmidt. And Manny Trio's infield hit scored Del Unser. And that left it to Tug McGraw once more to protect the lead. He did, not without the customary theatrics. McGraw loaded the bases. That up the presence of Jose Cardinal. But it was McGraw who built the drama like a playwright. In the end, he who took the bows again. Cardinal was out. The Phillies were almost in. The sixth game back in Philadelphia was nearly a rerun. The Phillies led 4-1 to in the ninth inning, but the team's other leader, Pete Rose, makes this great catch. It wasn't over yet. McGraw loaded the bases once more. It's not supposed to be easy in Philly, you see. This team had always found a way to lose in postseason play before. And once again, one more time, McGraw ended it with a floor. He struck out Willie Wilson. W.C. Field, said McGraw. Which is he could celebrate with us. I spent a lot of years in Philadelphia as a columnist. The bad years. So down at the sixth game, a really interesting thing happened from my view. Sensing the really deep frustration of the fans for so many years, frustration ingrained in the pavement, a group of Phillies came out on the field after the game. Pete Rose, Dallas Green, I don't remember the others. They all had champagne bottles, raised toast to the fans. Warmed me heart. Well, you mentioned Pete Rose, Larry, and it was a Philadelphia television station that kicked in about $600,000 just to get him away from Cincinnati. And look at the big TV bucks that Ted Turner is spending down in Atlanta, and Gene Autry and George Steinbrenner, just a fact of life. Big TV bucks for everyone in the National Football League. Maybe that's why they're about as close to parity as the law allows. For most of 1980, the story of the National Football League could be described by arcs. Beautiful, spinning arcs. Lay the rainbows fill the air again, as they did in the days of Unitas and Van Brocklin, when the quick striking excitement of pro football made it the longest running hit series on television. Through the 70s, defenses discovered ways and means to neutralize both the aesthetic beauty and the scoring potential of the pass. Sophisticated zone defenses to confuse quarterbacks, big fast linemen to harass and dismember them, linebackers to blitz them, and scoring plunged to its lowest ebb in four decades. As a result, league elders adopted rules to give the offense a break. Offensive linemen, long considered the mere shock absorbers for the wild head slaps and the rhino charges of defensemen, were permitted to use their hands to block, if not to hold. These liberalized rules gave quarterbacks precious fractions of seconds more to find receivers. And the receivers were given freedom of movement in the secondary. Intimidating hits by defensive backs were discouraged by strict enforcement of the rules. Quarterbacks, too, were protected from overzealous defenders who were looking for trophies for their den walls. And the pass was mighty and began to prevail again. It was harder for teams that emphasized one great runner instead of passing to dominate the Earl Campbell came within 100 yards of O.J. Simpson's 2,000-yard record, but the Oilers struggled through much of the season and were beaten in the playoffs as a wild-card entry. The Detroit Lions improved dramatically with the addition of Billy Sims, a strong, dazzling open field runner who gained over 1,300 yards. But without a passing attack to complement him, the Lions bit the dust. The Chicago Bears came up even shorter despite the continuing brilliance of Walter Payton. Campbell is the best big back since Jim Brown. Payton is a worthy successor to O.J. Simpson as a classic back. That was enough to get the Bears into the playoffs a few years ago and close last year, but it got them nowhere in 1980. Their frustration was dramatized in the most controversial single play of the season, when Peyton pulled close to a touchdown that probably would have given the Bears a commanding lead over the Falcons. Officials ruled, incorrectly, that he had fumbled, and Peyton was ejected for bumping an official. 
Coach Neil Armstrong was fined $2,000 for publicly complaining about the call, but the NFL later admitted he was right without a refund. The big break of the season turned out to be a broken leg suffered by Oakland's Dan Pastorini. That gave Jim Plunkett an opportunity he took advantage of. Earlier, in just one play, he tied a game being played against the San Diego Chargers with this touch pass. The Chargers, however, flew back when Fouts hit his favorite receiver, John Jefferson, for the winning touchdown in overtime. A month later, when Plunkett was playing full-time, the dramatic storyline of the season burst on the country in a Monday night game in Pittsburgh. Plunkett sat on the bench in 1979. He had been one of the giants of college football at Stanford, but injuries wrecked him physically and mentally as a pro. Now, with the new rules and the Oakland offensive line, he was thriving. He put 45 points on the board against the vaunted Steeler defense. That game also signaled the decline of the great Steeler dynasty. The defense that had once intimidated and smothered the best offenses couldn't get to the quarterback anymore. The revived Raiders focused attention on the feud between co-owner Al Davis and the rest of the league and Pete Rozelle. He was suing them for $150 million because he wouldn't let them move the franchise to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, or Anaheim, the 1970 daytime soap opera of the Rams was elevated to prime time soap opera. Seven prominent Rams held out on the widow of Carol Rosenblum. Quarterback Vince Ferragamo threatened to walk out in midseason over a salary dispute. It looked like he was becoming the next Joe Namath, a sex symbol. One X out on two. Let's go. Ready? son of Georgia Rosenblum, Steve, whom she fired, wound up in New Orleans, running what the fans there called the Aints. The Aints became America's poor stepchild, winning just one game. In the land of the urban cowboy, Houston, football's favorite cowboy, Bum Phillips, came to the end of the trail. Phillips traded Dan Pastorini for Ken Stabler for the express purpose of beating the Steelers in the playoffs. But the Steelers weren't there. Stabler completed a lot of little passes, but he also threw a lot of interceptions. And when the Raiders threw an umbrella over him in the wild card playoff, Phillips was fired. But he was then hired by the Saints. There were other surprise teams who were helped directly by the pass-oriented rules changes. Joe Ferguson of the Buffalo Bills suddenly found himself here throwing to Frank Lewis. Steve Bartkowski of the Falcons, once considered too stationary target, now had more time to throw and three talented receivers to throw to, like Alfred Jenkins. The Bills won the Eastern Division of the AFC with the help of rookie running back Joe out of Auburn, who gained nearly 1,200 yards. The Falcons had won the West in the NFC with a college teammate of Cribs, Willie Andrews, who gained 1,300 yards. Brian Seip was another quarterback who became a big winner, and with him the Cleveland Browns who won the Central Division of the AFC. Seip won game after game and all pro recognition with last-minute heroics, but sometimes he became the last-minute victim. Against the surprising Vikings, Seip threw this interception with a one-point lead and the clock running out. And on the very last play of the game, another quarterback with a big year, Tommy Kramer, threw a desperation pass and Ahmad Rashad took the carom into the end zone, and with it, the Vikings into the playoffs. The Cowboys had a brand new hero at quarterback, too. Dan White was groomed to fill the shoes of the retiring Roger Starbuck, and he liked the fit. Like Starbuck, when the going got rough, he went to Drew Pearson. Twice in the last three minutes of the playoff game with the Falcons, White and Pearson connected to win the day. But against the rugged defense of the Philadelphia Eagles, which allowed an average of just two touchdowns per game, neither White nor Tony Dorsett could win the day. Dorsett, who set a record with his 4,000-yard season in his first four seasons, was hounded and surrounded, and nearly dislodged from his shoes by hits like this. Meanwhile, Wilbert Montgomery found the once impregnable Dallas defense as open as a four-lane highway. 
Montgomery gained nearly 200 yards in the NFC Championship game. And that inspired his partner, Leroy Harris, to put some hurt on the Cowboys with inspired charges and bounces like this, which made the Eagles the most consistent team in the NFC all season long. In the AFC, the Raiders had a little luck, a lot of skill, and more defense to win that championship. Remember when they were the victims of Franco Harris' famous immaculate reception? Raymond Chester got it back for them. And Jim Plunkett found Ken King in the end zone with still another leather rainbow. Dan Fouts hooked up with Charlie Joyner on this one. But the Raiders couldn't have made it all the way back without the big play genius of two defenders. Linebacker Ted Hendricks, who was given the freedom to roam, and usually roam right into the ball, or the ball carrier, or the ball thrower. And cornerback Lester Hayes just refused to be intimidated by rules that were supposed to make his kind an endangered species. He intercepted five passes during the season, and five more in the playoffs. So, when all was said and done, two teams that practiced the old-fashioned virtue of defense collided in New Orleans. And, as advertised, it quickly became a defensive game, and Jaworski's pass was intercepted by Rod Martin on the first series of plays. Jim Plunkett, with lots and lots of time to throw, connected with Cliff Branch in the end zone, and the Raiders were on their way. Jaworski found a receiver in the end zone, but this touchdown was nullified by an unforced error, one of many by the jittery Eagle. Plunkett then made his own time by scrambling. He found Ken King on the sidelines. King fled to a touchdown, the longest in Super Bowl history, 80 yards. Rushed by Ted Hendricks and friends, Ron Jaworski had nowhere near the time that Plunkett had to find his receivers. And here's another leather rainbow by Plunkett into the arms of Cliff Branch again for a touchdown. Playing catch up, Jaworski threw a second of three interceptions to Martin. Here, he finally connects for a touchdown, but it was small consolation. Rod Martin and the Oakland Raiders, underdogs from game one to game 20, were kings of the NFL. But it really was quite a year in football. All that passing had to be good showbiz because television ratings reached a new high. In fact, NBC is having its own player draft. It wants Terry Bradshaw to do a primetime sitcom pilot. And if it plays, he won't. Well, the ratings were down in college athletics, academic ratings, for this was the year of the academic scandals. They were rampant. Corruption was institutionalized in so many colleges that you needed a scorecard to tell the honest ones from the dishonest ones. And that seems unlikely to change until so-called student athletes realize that when a coach promises to help them cheat through school, he's really cheating them of their educations, which do have value. Well, I think it's interesting that in both football and basketball, the problem was manifest in the most prestigious events. Take the NCAA basketball final between UCLA and Louisville. UCLA had a Cinderella team, four freshmen, and an All-American Kiki Vandaway. They proved without a doubt if it's still needed proving that gifted freshman athletes can compete on the varsity level. The Dr. Duncan style, the great Daryl Griffith, led Louisville to its first national championship. Griffith matured into a leader in his senior year, adding that missing element to his talent at putting the ball in the hoop made him the best player in the country. Yet at the very time responsible college educators and coaches were beginning to question the use of freshmen on varsity teams, because for so many of them the social and classroom adjustments are harder than the athletic adjustment, Herschel Walker was starting the greatest freshman season a college athlete ever had. In the Georgia-South Carolina game, he went head-to-head -head with George Rogers, the Heisman Trophy candidate who, as a senior, eventually did win the Heisman Award. But Rogers was terrific. But Walker, a 6-foot, 2-inch, 215-pounder with sprinter speed, was better. Walker wound up breaking Tony Dorsett's freshman rushing records and leading Georgia to a 12-0 national championship season. 
He scored both of their touchdowns against Notre Dame in the Sugar Bowl to clinch the championship. Walker is also a 3-6 student, an exception on and off the field. But there is still need to question the system. Should it be designed for the great athlete or the student athlete? When the NCAA convened for its annual convention in Miami, it was thought that strong action would be taken to deal with recent scandals in recruiting and transcript forging. Many coaches supported the ban of freshmen from varsity competition, but they were rejected. In every single violation this year, it has not been an institution that's set out to, uh, to cheat. It's been some nut who uh, they hired. Uh, maybe our hiring uh, practices are not right. I think any thinking person in sport today knows that, that we're doing a lot of dumb things in intercollegiate athletics. Our rule book uh, has become so complex uh, that it takes a Philadelphia lawyer to understand it. I think that, that the institutions uh, ought to, uh, to be blamed, not the coaches. Obviously, the coaches were involved in the abuses, but so much of it went on without even the coaches and the players knowing about it. I look at it as an institutional problem. Obviously, we've hired people, uh, in some cases, with a lack of integrity. The coaches themselves were uh, very anxious to do what's right. Uh, we had 40 coaches in the College Football Association get together and demanded that we have normal progress. Pushed to have a grade point average of a 1.8 at the end of the first year and a 2 at the end of the second year in order to be eligible. I think the blame has to ultimately rest with the president of the university. They are really responsible for everything. But if we can be more specific, it would have to rest with the director of athletics. I think we're seeing rules right now where, where coaches are, and athletic directors are beginning to say, wait a minute, let's, let's place some restrictions on the, on the recruiting time frames. The coaches is caught in the middle. He's got an administration that wants to look over its shoulder. He's got booster clubs and everybody else pushing him into a you got to win situation. And he gets blamed for the abuses, where in reality, he really wants to do it the right way. Nobody wants to take responsibility, least of all college presidents. When I went to Oklahoma, the president said that he hoped to build a university the football team could be proud of. By that, he meant that he hoped the football team could inspire interest in the rest of the university. Years later, I ran into him and asked him if it had worked. Nope, he said. All the football team did was inspire more interest and money for the football team. I remember doing an interview with Shelby Metcalf, the basketball coach at Texas A&M, about recruiting. And he said, you know, he said 95% of the universities and colleges in these United States do not violate any recruiting standard or any recruiting practice. I said, what about the other 5%? He said, they're nationally ranked. <laughs> Having said all that, I'm reminded of something Joe Paterno said about one of his athletes. What God had in mind there was a football player. Well, what God had in mind with a couple of college boys last year were basketball players, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. We're going to take a look at them and some other great champions of 1980. Bird graduated right into the Boston Celtics lineup, and he played like a big Bob Cousy, shooting, rebounding, and passing, playing unselfishly. He led the Celtics back into the playoffs and was named Rookie of the Year in the NBA. In the finals of the playoffs, it appeared that Julius Irving would lead the 76ers to a championship when Abdul-Jabbar was injured. But Magic Johnson, who had bested Bird in the NCAA finals a year before, led the Lakers to the championship, almost single-handedly. The numbers he put up in that game are recited with awe. 42-15-7. 42 points, 15 rebounds, and 7 assists. And he was just three years out of high school. Here's a horse that's just three years old and a girl who ran against the boys in the big one, the Kentucky Derby. Her name, Genuine Risk. A filly hadn't won the Derby since 1915. But she won it convincingly and despite some rough going, she proved to be the best of the Triple Crown crop, finishing second both in the Belmont and here in the Preakness. In the Preakness, she was slightly bumped by Codex coming into the home stretch just as she was making her move. Stewart refused to uphold an objection in her behalf, and she was beaten. It was a big year for another thoroughbred. Spectacular bid confirmed his claim as one of the great Colts. He was a two-year-old, three-year-old, and four-year-old champ, and finally he ran out of horses to beat. He won more money than any other racehorse, and he went to stud for $22 million. But there was another horse that had a legitimate claim as the greatest of his kind ever. Niatros, the perfect pacer. He smashed every record around. 
They say grown men wept when he went under 150 in the mile, breaking the record by nearly three full seconds. He too has been retired to stud. Among two-legged runners, Bill Rogers won his fourth Boston Marathon. But the real story was the runner here in orange, Rosie Ruiz. After being crowned the winner, she was found to have cheated, and Jacqueline Garrow was honored as the real winner. In the New York Marathon, Bill Rogers was once again expected to be a repeat winner. But Alberto Salazar, running in his first marathon, won in record time. While Greta Waite set another world record for women, and Rosie Ruiz was nowhere in sight. Speaking of records, records that might stand forever, consider Giorgio Chinaglia of the New York Cosmos. Professional soccer may have died on network television last summer, but Chinaglia gave the liveliest performance of this or any year. Starting in the 21st minute, Chinaglia was a scoring machine. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, seven goals did he score. Seven goals in one game. Aside from the Olympics, the only major international competition the U.S. regularly has is the America's Cup. We've been winning it for more than a century, in part by keeping the hometown edge off Newport, Rhode Island. The Australians challenged again this year, but they were no match, winning just one of five races from the U.S. Boat Freedom. Jack Nicklaus, already regarded as the best golfer we've ever seen, added to his legend in 1980. At age 40, coming off a year when he didn't win a single tournament, he first won the U.S. Open and then the PGA to become only the third man to win them both in the same year. He's now won 19 major titles, six more than the legendary Bobby Jones. In 1980, Jack was back. And right behind him, Tom Watson was rolling along to victories in more tournaments for more money than anyone. Last year, I won more money than ever before. Tom Watson for E.F. Hutton. So I talked to E.F. Hutton. You'll never know when you'll need the money. Observing games and the people who play them, I often get the feeling they're merely auditioning for show business careers. I mean, real showbiz. Sure, if they have a good audition on the field, they move right up the ladder to commercials. So we thought we'd show you the real winners in today's game. First, the He-Man commercials. Like pitching a perfect game. If I pitch the way Jockey makes underwear, I never lose a game. Aqua Velva, it makes a man. Feel like a man, right there? All right. Calls for men, relax and always include skull. The smokeless tobacco, nothing's gonna make me move. I think I'll play some touch. Let's go, old brother. That's my own car. Athletes, large and small, drive and sell cars. Will Chamberlain does it. Then get ready to be astonished again. Why? Because you're about to see me. Get in. If you ask for a number... O.J. Simpson's now flying through airports. Your Ford or other fine car and contract will be waiting at the number one express booth. And Magic Johnson and Willie Shoemaker have something in common as well. Right, Shoe? So, in any size, wouldn't you really rather have a Buick? Women, they snap photos. I'm tennis pro Tracy Austin. To some, I'm still a schoolgirl. To others, I'm a tough competitor. Hi, this is the biggest value in 35mm cameras today. The Konica FS1. I'm Johnny Bench, and I know how to prevent runs. This is how I do it at home play. And this is how I do it at home. And a couple of guys who play hardball. A uh, hard sell. Only Panasonic plays as brilliantly as I do. Panasonic TV. So lifelike, you feel you're part of the picture. The only wide body is TWA flies. So every TWA flight... Sometimes whole teams do it. The Pittsburgh Steelers used to sell luggage. Now they sell a whole airline. And those guys are my favorite wide bodies. You're gonna like us, T.W.A. You're gonna like us. Who are those guys? They're the New York Rangers pushing jeans. Ooh, 
nostalgia's big these days. Remember Joe Namath? And so all the toilet trees have the same great smell of brute. A finishing touch of brute 33 cologne. Make every day his brute day with a brute 33 gift set. Go get him, Joe. And That's Bob Lilly. Time to reach for a Black & Decker finishing sander. Because they're the best-selling line of finishing sanders in America. It's a crispy, refreshing feeling. A soda pop and his kid. Larry's turning seven up, and it sure feels right. Feeling lucky. Seven, seven, Good huh? Seven, seven, seven up. Mr. Brett, maybe you ought to choke up on the bat. It might help it help me. Seven up, I'm feeling seven up. Athletes and former athletes do drink other stuff. And in fact, natural light tastes so good, it makes me want to sing. Oh. Natural light. Hey, I think I'll try a swig of this. Billy, will you use a spoon? Oh, no! Do you know that light's got a third less calories than a regular beer? And listen to this. Light doesn't fill me up. Besides that, light tastes fantastic. Oh, sure, there are a lot of other beers around, and you can drink any one you want. But let me tell you this. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer, unless. If they're good enough, athletes may graduate to bigger things, like movies. Bruce Jenner in Can't Stop the Music. <laughs> You're dangerous on your feet. <laughs> we won't have to worry about that for a while. <laughs> what are you doing? These are the 80s, kid. And then, in a movie that is a candidate for an Academy Award, Raging Bull, a remarkable actor, Robert De Niro, virtually turned himself into the athlete he portrayed, former middleweight champion Jake LaMotta. The same producers who gave us the fairy tale of Rocky, this time give us the sordid realism of the ring. You want to take it out? You take it out. In other hand-to-hand -hand combat, a playground player challenges a pro in inside moves. Come on, come on, come on. Put it up. Put it up. Ah! Damn it. What is this? All right, who's for me? Who's for me? Let's hear it. As a tough Marine father, Robert Duval went one-on-one -on -one with his son in the great Santini. Hey! Oh, that's dirty play. Eight six, Hog, you're finished. Says you. Great day for baseball here at Yankee Stadium. And Yankee York, fan Yankee Paul State Simon on. showed us how Both Yankee announcers do it in One Trick Pony. On the mound for the Red Sox, their ace, the fantastic starter, Dennis Eckersley. First batter for the Yankees will be... Reggie Jackson. Eckersley looks in for the sign. And the pitch. Red swings and swung on. That could be out of here. It's big Reggie trouble. You see, fans do like announcers. It's just that they don't like so many of them. And that's why one of the memorable events of the year turned out to be a noble TV experiment. It was too much like being at the ballpark without the advantages of being there. It proved two basic things. Announcers are needed, but fans need a little less of them. But whether it was because of us or in spite of us, 1980 was a great year in sports. 81 has got a tough act to follow. Next month, on our first regular edition, we will present three feature stories. A rare behind-the-scenes look at the making of a trade in baseball. I spent a week in Dallas with the New York Mets. Fascinating story. And Larry has a profile of the new heavyweight champion, Larry Holmes. That and a whole lot more. Till next month, then, for Larry Merchant, I'm Barry Tompkins. We will see you one month from now on the HBO Sports Magazine. <laughs>